Hello and welcome everybody to another episode, another week with Bearski Film. Tonight we're joined by a really cool guest, Brad from Unbearable Sports. Uh, if you guys have not checked out his YouTube channel, definitely check it out. He's got a lot of great content. And uh, how are you doing tonight, Brad? You know, I'm I'm hanging in there like the rest of us Bears fans, right? So it's 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 un unfortunate, but yeah, we'll we'll get it out, talk some sports, talk some bears. But yeah, thankful to be on this show. So thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. And man, it's it's just a week filled with such high emotion, and it it's amazing how quickly this thing has gone so sour. And it's just it's all over the place. And I mean, I, I was kind of going through it, and it's just at every level there is fault. Starting with Caleb Williams missing some easy throws, just being inaccurate when the opportunities for easy plays are there, which haven't been a lot, but sometimes they do try and do something for him to help him out a little bit. It, it, he has not executed. And so then you look at Shane Waldron, not making it easy enough, consistently enough to groom a rookie quarterback and, and just not putting together a good game plan, not having any kind of rhythm in play calling or anything. And then you look at Matt Eberflus, who had Luke Getzey here for two years and went out and decided to get Shane Waldron. And ultimately, it falls on him as the head coach for all those things. And then you look at Ryan Poles for sitting there during the offseason and not even interviewing another head coach as if there's no better option out there than Matt Eberflus. And then, although I don't like to go here much, you know, then you look at ownership and you go, OK, and we're also too cheap to fire this guy because we'd have to pay him while we still pay another coach. And so it's just remarkable how. At every step of the way, there's there's bad issues. And the stories that are coming out, too, about the whole, like, four years or five years for Matt Eberflus, I think that's something that's, like, five years you give to a proven head coach. And it sounds like, from based on the stories from, like, Brad Biggs, Adam Rank, they're saying that Flus might actually have five years rather than the typical four, which maybe it's because they knew that they were going to be blowing things up year one. But still, doesn't make much sense. And like to your point, Paul, you're you're a billion dollar organization. What five billion or whatever it is, you can afford that, right? Like that's the big thing that's frustrating. You're a billion dollar org. You you, you got to make the right moves, and you have to keep on moving on. And also, too, they need a new pro scouting department because Shane Waldron. Why, why didn't we know more about like his actual personality before hiring him? Same thing with like a Nate Davis, simple pro development, pro scouting that we just didn't do with some of these people. Brad, I actually texted David the other day and I said, do you know what Mike Rabel said when they got rid of Nate Davis? <laughs> yeah. We want guys that practice. Yep. There was your evaluation right there. I don't know, David. No, I mean, I, I agree with all your guys' points and I can get into more details on how I personally feel and stuff. But yeah, the facts are the facts. Um, ironically enough, if, I, if I'm if i not dead on on this, I know it's in there, like top three, top four per person in terms of staff members. The Chicago Bears have one of the largest front office stabs in the NFL. So I don't know the exact number or anything like that, but I remember listening to an anecdotal podcast comment from... Um, two of the guys that I really like and like to listen to and respect Hogan Johns. And they were talking about how walking through Hallis Hall is like, it's awkward. It's almost weird how many staff members you pass just like walking back on a day-to-day -day basis. They have, you know, a person for cleats and a person for the shoe that goes on the cleats. And then the, the, the laces, like a third person to lace the cleats. And then it, it's just kind of this. So everything is ass backwards. And then um, one for, to manage all three, right? <laughs> and then there's a guy to, to inspect the cleats after they've been laced by the first three guys, you know? And then so part of that, I think, goes into all the things that just piss me off today uh, tremendously. I'm, 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 I'm ebbing and flowing between apathy and pure rage. And um, if you know anything about me as a sports fan, like I'm ready to know. I'm ready. If it wasn't for this YouTube channel, I probably wouldn't watch a single game the rest of the year. Um, I do feel like part of my fandom now has been attached to uh, this investment of time and my my love for us doing this on a week to week basis. But I've boycotted Chicago Bulls basketball for 
five, seven years. Uh, I've boycotted the bears for two to three years at a time. Um, I still know what's going on in the background, but I'm dangerously close. And uh, part of that that makes me mad about what Brad brought up is, you know, for a billion dollar organization to have such a staff, right. To hire so many people and, but to still penny pinch when it comes down to, it's not like you're doing this all the time. It's not like you're firing coaches left and right. David Tepper is paying for, and if I'm not wrong, I'm close. It's three or four head coaches simultaneously, especially if he uh, goes into this year or uh, the Raiders right now are paying for three coaches simultaneously at the same time. So as much as those organizations aren't necessarily something to model yourself after, at least they're trying, at least they're doing something. And it's not like the bears are the bears are one of the teams in history. Never, ever done it before. It's not like you're doing this hand over fist and wasting millions of dollars. Do it one time and maybe it'll work out. You can't keep saying this won't work or make you better if you don't even try. And that's part of why I'm just so angry today. Well, you mentioned like good organizations. And one thing I always like to do on my show is kind of bring it back to like the real world, like us regular people that have to work normal jobs and stuff like that, where when you think about like some of the best leaders that you might have worked with and or higher ups and other things like that, they usually ask, well, there's one guy that comes to mind that kept on saying he's like, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? And like would keep asking that because as a leader, you're supposed to understand the big picture. You're not supposed to get involved with like emotions and stuff like that. But what's the big picture? And Paul, you kind of mentioned a little bit on this too, where Caleb hasn't been doing well. Well, also the wide receivers haven't been getting open, right? And the offensive line, the play calling, the defense can't stop anybody running the football. There's like six different problems. But also when you have something like that, then it goes into, well, what might be causing some of this and what might be the first problem we have to solve? And right now it's the morale. It's people giving up on this team, not wanting to be there. And if you have a problem with people not wanting to show up for work, Nate Davis and other things like that, to me, it boils down to the coaching staff. And I'm not a fan of firing the coaches left and right and other things like that. But this is a scenario where it makes a lot of sense, especially when you have Brown, who could easily step into an offensive coordinator spot because he's done it before at Carolina. You also have Washington, who's already your defensive coordinator, and also Hightower. During the offseason, he was a, a what head coach for the Shrine Bowl and has aspirations. Like when I was listening to, you mentioned Hogue. Hogue interviewed him and was talking about like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to be a head coach someday. You have the interim pieces there, and it seems like everybody is frustrated at Flus, like giving up on Flus and giving up on um, our offensive coordinator. So why not? Why not try and change the morale and try to get people to actually believe in this team? And, you know, and there's a there's a root cause to that. I mean, we all know it. It's four major collapses. I mean, you have four games where you had a 95 percent chance or higher to win in the fourth quarter. And time after time again, you failed, you failed, you failed and you failed. And I, I take it back to last year, I believe after. The second one, because the first one was, I believe, the Broncos. The second one was um, the Lions. After that one, I was like, I'd be done. As a player, I'd be done. And, and credit to them, they weren't. They still kept going. But then, you know, you, you you had that terrible game, I believe, against the Browns where it came down to a Hail Mary that you didn't get, right? Or you came a yard short. Like, you, you've had all these just terrible, terrible losses and collapses and here we go again this year and it roars its ugly head back in and this year all it took was one all it took was that washington game for these guys to just be like that's it well like brad said and then the the morale because paulie you and I, you and i literally right after washington i we called each other and i'm like man i i can't fathom how you as a player can come back the next week and keep playing hard and stuff like that. And the only reason I wasn't brave enough to make that statement like on the shows or publicly, or just kind of saying it more with uh, like chest out was because I said, I've, I've said this four times before I've said this every time, every time they did this. And I was like, I can't fathom being a fan and seeing this and doing this or being a player and seeing this and coming out the next week and playing hard for this coach. And, yeah, I, this had to be the one that broke the camel's back. And I was saying it's a poly for Arizona. Like, there's no way. There's no way. It can't happen again. They can't come out again. And But 
I haven't been proven right yet. I, I be, I've been proven wrong every time. This one had to be the straw that broke the camel's back. It After a while, it adds up. And part of it was, I think, going back to our collective thought on this is we said that you know, while your players are young and while they're being molded and while they'll believe anything, you can get away with this rah rah bullshit and you can kind of blame the kids for it because that's what college coaches do, right? They blame the kids and they know best. And that's why these guys come into the NFL, these college coaches, and they, they fail catastrophically because they can't point fingers anymore. They have to like, they have to self own and self scout a little bit and do stuff like that. And when Matt Eberflus got hired, you know, we were talking about the hits principle and how it's a cute little gimmick and stuff like that. But these guys became pros over the last two, three years while Matt Eberflus was still staying in the same place. So you hired this guy who was a decent coach to get you through the hard times who can mold some young players. And then now these are professionals and they know what they're doing. They've been doing it for three, four years since you've been here. And they don't buy your bullshit anymore. You got Jaquan Brisker coming out on Twitter today. I forget the exact thing he tweeted, but something along the lines of, if you if you keep trying the same shit, you're going to get the same result or something along those lines. Like, And so that's what you're having right now. you got these pros who are fed up. And like Brad said, with morale, I think that's the only – because you're naming these areas, right? Offensive line, quarterback. What's the mm-hmm. one thing you can do to kind of trickle in a little bit of sauce into all those areas? As a manager, you can you can improve the the joy, the morale. You can't fix each problem individually. Dave, the rookie QB is fed up. Yeah. Not even the pros. The rookie quarterback is well, fed up. That's because he's he's probably ahead of his schedule, right? Like he is a mature person who's eye rolling already at Shane Waldron nine games in, going like, dude, you don't know what the fuck well, you're talking because about. Because three games in, he was running to the sideline chewing him off for not getting the plane fast enough. Right? Yeah. Like it, like you you know, Brad, just to I'm gonna let you respond here in a second, just to give you a little bit of background. David and I know each other through work. I used to be his manager. He used to be an employee under me. And I was, I'm was i totally, totally fine with um, with being what's it, Michael Scott from The Office. You guys yeah. want to just have fun and let this thing ride? <laughs> sure. But it's, it's really, truly your employees that kind of sometimes set the expectation for you of, hey, are we taking this serious or, or are we not? Like, is you know what I mean? And then from a point of management, in my opinion, it's important to listen and kind of respond in that manner. And so, like, you know, seeing Caleb do that, it's like, okay. But then, you know, at the same time, these guys have been in football their whole lives. And and you so talk they about, like, should be setting the expectations high. Like, it should be set. And, like, what Dave said, like, they're professionals. And it's, like, kind of that whole manager aspect. Like, the whole new wave of management is, like, empathy and, like, being like, yeah, you know what? I got it wrong. And I think about like Mike McDaniel, the Miami coach, you hear all of his mic'd up moments where he's like, yeah, sorry about that too, a bad play. And, and just kind of moves on. And it's that the thing that I said that I got a little bit of flack, um, a couple of people didn't like it that I said this, I disagreed with the Tyreek Stevenson benching, not saying he shouldn't have been disciplined, but why I, why I disagreed was because the coaching staff did not take accountability for blatant mistakes that they made and the the players knew that the players understood but when you discipline a player but you don't discipline yourself while everybody there your your employees your players are not stupid they know that you effed up and the fact that they did not take accountability then what was the first thing that Matt Eberflus said at like after they got whooped in for the Cardinals he's like ah this is all the coaching staff and you know it's BS because after this game, when he was asked about that, they're like, "So what would you change?" Uh, just like everything, e- everything could be better. And then you ask it's, Caleb Williams, and he's like, "I could do this. I could do this." So it's just BS, and it's like people can smell BS a mile away. And I think that's where everyone's given up. Where it's you're not going to take accountability, so why should we? So it's it's one of my least favorite societal kind of things going on right now. Is is being so dead set or hardcore on your opinion and then hard over correcting when you're proven wrong instead of finding nuance or middle ground. And so that's what this is, right? Is like Matt Eberflus was just always in this hard, hard this direction and well, the players need to execute better and we need to look at the tape the next day. It's like, dude, do you not know what you saw yet? Like you need a day or two to process. 
And then it's like, well, now it's like, you know what we, yeah, it's all on me. Blame me first, blame me. First. And it's just this hard, hard overcorrection that just, like you said, it's just so disingenuous and just not believable. And, uh, and it's just, it's, it's disgusting to watch. And that's why part of it is you can't, we can't even watch it. And imagine going to work and listening to someone try to motivate you and talk you into working harder now because you're Michael doing Scott. bad. <laughs> yeah. And Michael Scott trying to tell you to work harder. Yeah. It's, it's so, wild. So Brad, that's where you're completely right. And like, so although I was all for the Tyreek Stevenson benching, I also have a philosophy on how I would like my football team to be ran. So I get exactly what you're saying because you've established three years of a certain way of doing things. And so you benching Tyree Stevenson doesn't necessarily fit into that mold of what you've been doing. So I understand that. I prefer, even though this guy didn't have much success in the NFL, I prefer what Mike Singletary did. Went out right after the game and called on Vernon Davis. Can't win with him. Mm -hmm. Can't win. But, but he had established that he's a no bullshit kind of guy. And so what you're going to get from him is no bullshit. And like, you know, to, to not be able to process things in the moment, to need a day or two or three to reflect on it is damning to me i mean that is just that's terrible and you know i i, I my father-in-law always likes to bring this up to me he says he saw a, a video with bill belichick talking about him and brady's relationship and be like i'd see three to four different things on any given play brady would run to the sideline and name me seven or eight different things so don't act like you can't learn from the player as the coach like there's clear communication there and there's also respect for the talent and and you know what i mean and then there's just a conversation a decision and execution and it just seems like that is a mile away from what the bears have going on and and that's where it's like the players need to get better right caleb has to perform better everybody has to perform better but it's the same thing when the, since the coaches aren't taking accountability and you're fed up and you're giving up on the coaches. And then if someone comes in and be like, hey, yeah, uh, if you could just be better at your job, that'd be great. Right. Like we'll they save my job and then we're all happy. <laughs> and then, you know, like and that's where I think that kind of comes in. We were kind of alluding to this. And that's part of uh, one of my questions. And I guess I'm just, I'll just kind of segue into it. Part of that problem and the whole reviewing tape for two days and this and that. One of my biggest things that I. I upset me today was when uh, I texted Paul, I think around 10 saying like, Hey, no one's been fired and I don't expect anybody to be fired. Paul pointed out the whole Dave Kaplan little mini fiasco that was there, which you can't convince me wasn't on purpose and totally staged. And it was literally him just going like, but I'm, the in paper a, to the phone. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm losing you. I'm losing I'm you. losing you in a tunnel. Oh, and so that's what that was. The bees, right? The bees. The bees are coming. <laughs> and then um, the other part of it is the fact that you needed an extra hour and a half. You delayed your press conference an hour and a half, your typical Monday press conference. And that's what you fucking trot out. That bullshit is what you needed the extra hour and a half. Forget the day. Forget the overnight part. That I can kind of fathom. Yeah, cool. Guess what? Sorry. Um, you're having a bad fucking time. I know you want to go home after we after work on Sunday. You're coming into the office. If you're Ryan Poles, if you're George McCaskey, if you're Kevin Warren, if you're anybody who fucking matters, and you're saying, Matt, drive your ass back to Hallis Hall, and we're meeting right now, and it's six o'clock, and you're gonna miss dinner. We'll order takeout. And we're going to talk this out so that tomorrow morning we have a plan in place because, and like how you guys kind of gave the, the parallels to work. And, you know, I always, certain times with my wife, like she knows football, she listens to us, but I'll kind of try to lay it out in a way of her job where I'm like, Hey, you got to do this press release or something. And your current boss is a moron and he's going, you know, you know, I might be gone by Wednesday. I might not. So keep working on this press release the way I like it to be done. And then we'll see what happens Wednesday. And then Thursday, a new boss comes in and goes like, scrap that. It's due Saturday. Let's do it again. Stop wasting those three days. Why are we wasting Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday? This should have been immediate. This should have been concrete. It should have happened last night. The decision should have been made. What did you possibly gain in the extra couple hours this morning? It's literally just a bunch of dorks going like, let's sleep on it and see how we feel tomorrow. 
because it makes no sense. The choice should be obvious. So to delay a what did you gain from an hour and a half delaying of a press conference? You are wasting so much time preparing for the Packers, which let's be honest, I'll take my life savings and bet it on the Packers right now. They're coming off a of bye week too. And yeah. that's exactly my point is you're wasting precious, precious hours that you don't have to prepare for the Packers, which George is going to be upset. Virginia is going to pooper, pooper, pooper diaper. Like she's going to shit her diaper. When she sees what the Packers do to the Bears this Sunday, because that, you know, nothing upsets Virginia like a Packers beating, you know, because that's really where our priorities are. While the Packers have been preparing for your dog shit performance for two weeks, they're probably done. They've been done four days ago. They, we don't need to see anymore. We don't need to study any harder, but they will be because that's a good franchise. And that was one of the most of all the micro and the macro of everything today. The, the extra hour and a half, as if you need it to figure. And then you still don't have an answer. Well, David, she was on fired, but he's not fired, but he won't call plays, but he might call plays. He was on the phone with T-Mobile trying to figure out his phone connection. Didn't you hear the Kaplan yeah. interview in the morning? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he had to do oh, that. Well. He was busy. You know, he probably he, did that to Ryan Poles. He saw the, the call from Ryan Poles and was like, I can't hear <laughs> <laughs> he gets home he's like shit i got a job for 24 more hours <laughs> he's like i'll just do the interview I'll, I'll i'll make something up i'll say it's uh my decision to figure out what happens with waldron right yeah i'll say that <laughs> yeah. yeah uh brad you know one of the things that i was talking to with david was in my opinion when it comes to head coaching impact i think the most impactful times coming from the head coach position come when the team is either really bad or really good and this all stemmed from somebody in a chat that i was participating in i was watching some podcasts somebody's like well you can't count the first year you can't count that three and 14 season the first year and i go well in that case like i, I looked at um ryan pace and i was like kevin white okay I'll give you a pass but then after mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake guess what kevin white now enters that conversation as the first mistake. So like, to me, your job as a head coach, it, it, like the impact you have is to be able to elevate a shitty roster and have it overperform based off the lack of talent. And when your talent finally gets good enough and your team's a playoff worthy team to take them over the top, but like this whole middle bullshit, a lot of coaches can do. You, you're relying on the talent and the talent can get you in the middle. No problem. But you, you have shown it, to me from day one that you're not able to elevate poor talent. And so like people kept saying, Hey, Iberflus, this good defensive guy. What was he before Monta sweat? What was he after Monta sweat gets hurt? All of a sudden this defense just doesn't look as good. Well, maybe it's because of Monta sweat and the defensive line pressure. That's actually creating opportunities for these guys. Don't act like you can't get another coach in here to get some production. The and parallel also, right now, sorry, Brad, to just kind yeah. of give you even a, a more accurate parallel. The parallel of what the year that Paulie's saying is wasted and doesn't count, the Broncos are doing it as we speak. There you go. They have Point. $60, $70 million in dead cap space with a rookie quarterback and a completely under-talented roster in the AFC West where the Chargers are beasts, where the Chiefs are beasts, and they're yep. six and three, Competing. six and four, whatever it is, five and four. Yeah, and Brad, they're what do you think? over 500 team. Well, it's it's the whole idea of like you said, coaching elevating the players that they have, and like I actually think that Eberflus on the defense because we had Allen Williams before everything was terrible, and then things started getting better. And I heard um, a non Bears podcast kind of talk about this, where they're like the Bears defense should not be this good still this year, but then all of a sudden everything started coming apart, and that's where too, like when you talk about the same old, same old. We've already seen this. Like if if Shane Waldron is going to be the goat, like the the scapegoat that they throw everything on, we saw this what six months ago, seven months ago when when we got rid of Luke Getze, and that was the only like the offense was the only thing that we did. So are we going to do that whole thing, that whole song and dance again? And that's where it yeah you just need to try something different because to the point of like people know that this is not going to end well. And if you just get rid of one of the managers, but the, the director, the person in charge that's still calling the shots is still there, people are going to be like, okay, what is this then? So you're just going to get rid of them. This is just the same exact stuff that's going over and over and over again. 
and no one's really going to want to play. And you have to do something for Caleb Williams. You really have to do something for him just so that this isn't a complete loss and he's just frustrated and he doesn't want to be here. Yeah, I mean, at this point, you're going to get him to just develop bad habits mm-hmm. and get used to them. And you're you're just going to sit here and destroy another quarterback. I mean, you are. And, and, you know, part of the conversation of who to get as offensive coordinator during the offseason, me and David were saying, okay, well, a guy like Cliff Kingsbury is out there. But you won't make that move because he has had coaching experience. It now threatens your position. If you get into a part of the season where you're not doing well and your head's on the chopping block, Guess what? There's a guy behind you that can obviously take your place. However, as a head coach, that shouldn't be your thought process or your concern. It should be, let's get every damn good, experienced coach in here to make this thing work and work right. The best teams, like, uh, you know, you could point to the Chiefs. Andy Reid's in charge of the offense. Their defensive coordinator was a head coach. I mean, the guy's experienced. He's good. Knows what he's doing. You know what I mean? And so you just, you can't sit there and let fear and desperation dictate the personnel moves you make like that. And, and yeah, I, I just, it, it sucks constantly trying this like next up and coming thing, trying to make names out of guys. Meanwhile, you as a head coach aren't even established. Like you're trying to create what a coaching tree out of nowhere. Uh, meanwhile, you've done nothing yourself. And I, I don't know, it kind of drives me nuts. And at the same time, it's like, we look at what the potential future candidates are. And so, like, the only experimental guy I would want or even entertain would be Ben Johnson. Just because it might be like a Kyle Shanahan situation where when he left the Falcons, he took all the success really with him because you you just saw that this guy's a good coach. But even that scares me a little bit because it's still an experimental thing. Like, I would – I'm so tempted to just be like, dude, just go get a guy that's that's done it even like a Mike Vrabel or somebody out there that they can bring in a staff here with them. But the guy that should have been Jim Harbaugh last year, it really should have. Yeah. I, I think when I look at like the coaching candidates, it's like, yeah, Ben Johnson, but not, I, I do not want another defensive person. Um, Like, cause exactly what you talked about, Paul, a lot of them, you can get these like old defensive coordinators. Well, that's, what's going to happen to Eberflus after he's gone. Someone's going to have Eberflus as their DC for for however long and you see that like Vic Fangio right after he had his shot at head coach uh Staley same thing where these good defensive guys get one shot then they're done then after that um the other thing too is like Ben Johnson when I was going through offensive coordinators like who could the Bears get the thing that really stuck out to me is when you look at play calling EPA right what play callers give you a better chance to win they're all the top 10 are head coaches besides ben johnson and who was like one of the only offensive coordinators that was going to get an offensive coordinator job was um i was gonna say luke getsy was shane waldron because they don't become available for offensive coordinator because they go to head coaches and so that's where like i that's where i also like the idea of of just firing them so that you know, it's not going to get a, you don't get a head start on anything, but it's nice for like a Ben Johnson just to be like, okay, it's available. It's, it's there. They officially moved on. So yeah, I don't know your take, Dave. No, David, you brought that exact point up to me before. Which part? That you almost have to have an offensive guy as your head coach because right. if you're a defensive guy, go ahead and explain always... that whole process. Yeah. Well, that's, that's just kind of one of those things that I'm sure Brad understands already in the last like 10 years that, the majority of the successful NFL head coaches have to be uh, offensive play callers and or offensive coordinators because if you have a defensive minded head coach and they are incredibly successful on offense, more than likely within two to three years of their success, they're going to be poached by some other team as the new head coach for them. So then you turn into this revolving door of, well, you can leave, but don't take too much of your staff with you because we want to do some, we want to maintain some consistency here, which is unrealistic. The NFL, the new head coach is going to take most of his staff with him. And then you're stuck holding the bag with this defensive guy and hoping that you can hire a new offensive coordinator. And that's what you see with player with teams. Like, I don't know, like the Steelers for even example, where, you know, they're, they're hiring this guy and then they're firing this guy, Matt Canada. Now they're hoping that Arthur Smith can have a new career revival kind of thing. And it's, 
it works, it's fine, but you're never going to see anything innovative. You're never going to see anything creative or revolutionary, especially when you have like young quarterbacks that you can kind of pair up with them and start figuring these kind of new and interesting things out. The Steelers is a good point just because I know Tomlin typically comes up as like the morale head coach and stuff like that. But to your point, it's like, yeah, the offense has been like something that the Steelers fans have hated. It holds them back years. for years. Yeah. yeah. And it's like the thing that holds them back. I'm curious about the Lions, too. It's like everybody's like, well, we need like a Dan Campbell. It's like there's only one Dan Campbell. And also, I'm really curious to see what happens to the Lions next year without Ben Johnson, because everything points to Ben Johnson being this unbelievable offensive mind. Now, there's more to being a head coach than just being an offensive mind. But I, I love the idea of him potentially being here. But yeah, it's like you can't just... It, to bank on that would be difficult, but to your point, Paul, Harbaugh was right there for the taking. But yeah, he's too alpha. He's too aggressive for the McCaskies. And that's kind of where even uh, I, Brad, even uh, uh, sorry, Brad Johnson, Brad Johnson scares me sometimes. Where he already kind of had that recent press conference quote that went viral, where he's going like, "I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna continue to call plays," right? And that that's a good thing, I suppose. But it can also be kind of a negative thing, right? Because if you're too preoccupied, then you do need to you need to pair Brad Johnson with like Robert Sala or Mike Vrabel yeah, yeah. or somebody. And you need to be comfortable enough with having these alpha guys walk in this room, each be responsible, but also respectful for their own, you know, situations and and their own, uh, you know, responsibilities and things like that. So, yeah, it's that's why Brad Johnson scares me because ben you don't Johnson. know. I'm sorry, I keep seeing looking at Brad and I see <laughs> Brad Johnson. Um, ben Johnson scares me because, yeah, there's a very distinct possibility he could be the next Matt Nagy, where he is this offensive coordinator. I'm sorry, like you take an untal under talented roster. One of the things that is carrying Detroit over the hump and allows Ben Johnson to do all these ridiculously cool things is because they're absurdly talented. And they can do, uh, you know, uh, double pass reverses with linemen that have been there and established for two years. You can't bring that in and do this next year. You can't bring that over here and just start fixing that. I don't care how many linemen you draft or how many free agents you sign or how many, you know, uh, quarterbacks, coaches you turn into your offensive coordinators. You can't be, come in here and expect that to work. You need to have a fundamental understanding of establishing an identity of what to do with this culture, what this team's complementary football style is going to be. Uh, see what talent you have, what things you need to change. And you can't do that overnight, even if you are Ben Johnson and you are immensely intelligent on the offensive side. And for those that are watching on YouTube, you probably saw my eyes going all over the place because I had to pull up this quote because, Dave, you reminded me of this, where Kevin Fishbane from The Athletic tweeted this out, where um, uh, Sando from the NFL, he put together a New York Times article where um, just basically saying that about the Bears, where – the GM won't want to fire the coach unless the president is on board with that and the president is not going to turn the reins over to a proven coach. And then execs around the league think a Bears structure featuring an empowerment engaged team president Kevin Warren all but rules out the possibility Chicago would seek established power coaches. So kind of goes to that whole thing of like, because they're saying that executives think because of Kevin Warren and just how the bears are, that they wouldn't go after one of these powerful coaches, like the, the dominant voices in the room, but it's like, yeah, it, you, you can't just have all these soft-spoken people. Like I always thought that Matt Eberflus looked like a preacher, um, that you would have where just kind of this, this laid back dude, but yeah, it's, so, it's frustrating. You know, <laughs> this I, is a, Sorry, Paul. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to say one more thing about Matt Eberflus. David, I'll let you respond, and then we'll go up to the next level and talk about Ryan Poles because I like how we're actually just going through from bottom to top, and I know Dave's got a lot to say about the very top too. So with Matt Eberflus, it's interesting. Do you, so we kind of went back and forth on this, me and David, and I had to look it up because um, Ryan Poles was hired, and then two days later, he hired Matt Eberflus. However, when he was hired, he was able to interview the second round of candidates, meaning the first round of candidates had already been kind of sifted through. And those three guys were Matt Eberflus, Dan Quinn. Man, I forget the last one. Uh, defense uh, coordinator, Baltimore Ravens. Uh, Mike McDaniel? 
No, no Mike no. Michael something though. No. Um, no, it's a old, old older soft spoken guy. Uh, Pose head coaching interviews. Yeah. Um. So it, it's just funny because you know. So he got to choose between those three guys, and um, and essentially picked Matt Eberflus. Right. However, what the, what they were saying is Matt Eberflus, Jim Caldwell, Jim Caldwell. Oh, there yeah. you go. Matt Eberflus, and I remember at that time actually wanting Dan Quinn due to the experience. I was like, he's not the best guy out there. He's been in a Super Bowl, though. Like, just get me the guy that kind of just knows what he's doing. But that's another topic, right? So Matt Eberflus, though, I believe the Colts were about to fire him. I don't think he was about to get retained by the Colts. He's about to just be let go for anybody to be able to, you know, take him as a defensive coordinator or whatever. And here we are giving him a promotion. That sounds eerily similar to a Waldron situation, doesn't it? Pretty much. So, like, you're kind of seeing that same thing repeat. Yeah, I'm trying to remember who, because I I heard that from um, it's from the like I listened to the Bet the Board podcast. It's Pain Insider, and uh, I forgot the other the other person, but they're very plugged in people. They actually were the ones that brought up um Chris Jones, like polls calling for Chris Jones uh, during the up. trade deadline. But yeah, they said they had very plugged in people that in the Colts organization that were saying, yeah, Flus was going to be fired. Instead, the Bears were like, yeah, we want him as head coach. And they're like, okay, uh, yeah, here you go. Here you go. You can talk to him. So, yeah. And so that just kind of, you know, now, uh, David, did you want to speak on the coaching level anymore? Or you want to take a step um, up to the GM? I know. Yeah, I just think I do have. I do have in terms of in terms of, and this can this can be brought up right after polls conversation or even at the top of this. But I had a good. I had a question for you guys in terms of like the percentages of blame to kind of pass around here, right? And in my mind, it's like the percent. If there's a hundred percent chunk, right? Maybe this isn't. Paul, you rolled your eyes. Maybe this isn't a fun. No, no, it's it's interesting. I like it because. But like to me, the players get five to ten. And David, and you know, usually I blame the players the most. And that's yeah. why I kind of shook my head because it's like, man, this is totally against what I'm usually about. It, 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 when it, you initially asked it, I was like, oh, man, I usually want to blame the players the most. Yeah, for me, it's so the players get I can't. five to ten. And then part of me is like, well, I want to blame Waldron a lot. But part of me also just sees the similarities between just the just disjointed nature and like, you know, depending on who we've had on the show, Brad, and you're one of our many guests that like kind of depends on your opinion. I was livid about uh, some of the offensive play calling and how people are blaming Shane Waldron for speed options or fullback dives to Doug Kramer. I'm sorry if you're a head coach with any merit, any sauce in your body, you hear that play call and you go, what the fuck are you talking about? Time out. Like that's not what we're talking. That's not what we've discussed. You do have a certain amount of allowance as Shane Waldron, based on what you discussed with Matt Eberflus. And if Matt Eberflus's but, job, in terms of the offensive side of it, is just to say, "Hey, Shane, I have full trust in you," that's a problem too. Yeah, and we talked about this, David. We talked about this during the offseason. We're going to need Shane Waldron to come in here and be the hero of the day, because at the end of the day, like. Okay, so Ben Johnson wants to call plays, and we've seen the whole thing where, like, you're too much of an offensive coordinator and not a head coach. However, the defense is a lot easier to figure out. You still had Vic Fangio here, right? We have a defensive coordinator as a head coach, and it feels like he's got no input on the offense, and we saw that based off the offense changing from Getsy to Waldron. And it, it is like, I trust you completely. And in that case, like, what are we doing? You've been in football your whole life. You have these guys out there that are special teams coaches that come in. Why? Because they have an established philosophy on defense and on offense. And they're just going to get guys to sit there and run their philosophy, run their plays. Eberflus doesn't have it. But part of that problem, too, is that Matt Eberflus this summer was just so excited to talk about how much input he's going to have in the offensive room and helping Caleb Williams and how much he's going to teach him about offense by teaching him about defense and this and that. And that's he actually came out and that was one of his like big summertime talking points. He said hair and offensive involvement. Right. And then but this is what comes out of it is these two offenses that look extraordinarily similar right 
like two totally different play callers, two totally different systems, but we have two guys running the same route to the same part of the field. How that fucking happens with two different guys with two different philosophies is beyond me. It has to devolve or be part of that chunk of the percentage of blame to Matt Eberflus when he goes over the tape because he goes over the tape for two straight days. He needs to go, what the fuck was this, Shane? This is not acceptable. I should never see this route or this play ever again. Brad, and, I don't want to keep he's talking gonna, over you. Yeah, so. yeah. Oh, yeah, no man, worries. I was just going to say, like, I think exactly what you're talking about, Dave, where the whole self-scouting, where you need to be able to be on the defensive side and look, because the Patriots were saying, we saw the tells. Our defensive staff said that the Bears are going to do this, the Bears are going to do that. And there's times like, I, I'm going to review the All-22 tape right after this. And like, when we go through it, there's so many different plays that you just go, oh, they're probably going to do this, right? They always do the, the corner to the, they always do a corner followed by another little out route right there. They consistently do stuff like that, and it's it's predictable, but also there's a fine line between crazy and genius, right? It, it depends on what someone's perception is of you. And Shane Waldron loves to be this mad scientist of play development. Like he likes to create these weird designs. And to some people, it's that's a genius move. But right now, everyone in the Bears locker room is going, nah, you're just crazy right now, coming up with these different designs and if they're not bought in then that's where it's you know you're not this genius of an innovator now now you're this crazy person coming up with all these insane weird plays that just people don't want it to work so it just that simply doesn't work but i think brad kind of like he literally mid-sentence i had this epiphanal moment of like why does not only this offense not work it's why are all the players so demotivated running routes because and I saw this on Twitter yesterday too, where there's no purpose behind his play calling. There's none. There's no identity to it. That's a given, but there's no purpose behind it. We're not setting something up to set the next thing up. We're not doing something to create something else. It's just literally, I think it's like he hit like Madden shoes, flipped through a few pages and just said, fuck it. Let's run that one. Yeah. There's and still that's no what happens where. And that's what happens when a player is just going like this fucking play again. I'm going to run this shit half ass because I know it's not coming to me. And I or I know that it's not going to matter because this is a stupid fucking play and I'm about to run a stupid fucking route. Guys, I want to. Yep, go ahead, Brad. Yeah. Oh, I was say um, the one of the things, you know, when you talk about developing and like having that entire play call. Right. We know that the Bears wanted to run the uh, run the ball. Right. We also had the lowest amount of play action out of any team last week. So the whole thing of like developing the run and then running a play action, one could say, well, yeah, they have some blitzes, but if you're supposed to keep them honest and you're not even running a play action or anything like that, there's, there's that idea of that. He doesn't set up his plays where even the week before he ran this one look and then the very next play ran the exact same look doing the actual end around and they just stopped the end around. They're like, Okay, um, that's something that you should have called later on in the game. And it's he doesn't understand the concept of the game management. It feels like it feels like he just wants to have his little Madden create a play, create that and be like, oh, this might be able to work. And when the blitz comes, there's no hot receiver. There's nothing like that that he can have because everyone's backs are turned because they're running deep routes on third and four when they're sending a blitz. Yeah, and so... You know, it, it's it's damning. I wanted to share this little video with you guys that we actually made last year. I forget exactly after which game it was, but um, Brad, I'm gonna have to just take you off the screen so it looks a little bit better. But guys, check this video out. Players, it was a good call by the by the whoever this coordinator was. That was that would be me. Did you, did you hear that? Well, let me just replay that really quickly. We just replaced a uh, good call by the by the whoever this coordinator was. That was that would be me. And you stood up there all year and pointed a finger at the players on the execution. In the beginning of the year, I, I was with that. I was saying yes, the players need to execute better. It seems like this guy uh, is happier about having a good week of practice than the result of a, a game. And then to, to sit there and credit yourself like that. I mean, to whoever that coordinator was. By the way, that would be me. You, you got to be kidding yeah. me. When I, my jaw dropped, like, dude, you need to go. If you think that 
any of these players are going to play as hard as they did for you this last week after that coaching collapse at the end of that game, you, you're not going to get that kind of performance again all season from them. You're just not. And so, you know, we asked for accountability. There it was. Yep. Right? I'm accountable for that success. And so, you know, you, you have these damning things where it's like, okay, so, so now, you know, we talked about Ben Johnson coming in here and calling plays, but then like, can you even be an offensive genius with this talent on the field? And I was, I was part of uh, the chat in one of the podcasts where somebody asked the question of like, uh, has Ryan Poles neglected the offensive line. And so I guess it really determined it's determined by what your definition of neglect is because he has drafted five offensive linemen, right? One of them in the first round, Darnell Wright, one of them in the third round, Kieran Amagaji. And I believe you have Braxton Jones in the fifth. And then the other ones are um what's his name? Uh, Kramer and uh, Jatiri. Kramer and Jatiri Carter. Exactly. Doug Kramer was in Jatiri Carter. So have you really neglected it? No. Have you invested well into it no you sat there you haven't gotten a center you've band-aided that over and over and over so that's why i'm almost kind of like leaning more towards just get somebody who knows what they're doing in here because you, you're not at a point you know we always talk about playing checkers before you play chess you're not playing checkers yet like so to be trying to play chess with its town on the field you might get the same exact result and so that you look at ryan poles and you start to criticize his team building um, philosophy, the way he approached it. You know, we were big on tr trying to trade back in the draft from pick nine, getting a defensive end and getting a center. Why? Because that would be more impactful this year than wide receiver three. It's not that I don't like Rome. I even, you know, you, you said you got blessed for stuff than you said. I said I, I wouldn't take Marvin Harrison Jr. at nine because we're not in that position. And I got blasted for it. So it, it, I think it really falls on Ryan Poles as like failing to build this thing. Guys, we were the best team of first overall pick quarterback had ever stepped into, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden now we don't have that. Right. Now it's uh, but I, I want to say this too, because I wanna I I love what you said about that because something that I'm trying to get to catch on is the don't draft running, don't draft wide receivers high. And I mean this Huge like from that the analytics perspective, because I was diving into it. It's the only high value position that you can get in later rounds besides round one. Pretty it's, much. We and, got, we got to send Brad dude, the link. Of, like, yeah. yeah. I'll episodes. send you, I'll send you a couple <laughs> links, man, where we do break oh. it down as well. Like top 10 wide receiver picks. You got to go back to Keenan Johnson, right? No, or, uh, you know, Keenan, uh, what's his name? Keenan for the no, Jets. Right. Keyshawn, Keyshawn. Johnson. Oh yeah, yeah. Ninety six. He was the last top ten wide receiver picked to win a Super Bowl. It wasn't with the team that even drafted him. But it's like these guys over and over. Like it's it's a bad move, even if they work out. It's just yeah. not a good team building move. You, well, you can find the... Antonio Brown in the fifth. You can find Tyreek Hill in the fifth. You can find Puka Nakua in the uh, fifth. You can find Cooper, Cup, Cooper like, Cup in the third. You can find Devontae. these guys. Devontae Adams was a second round pick. Like no first round picks. Get a tackle, defensive end defensive tackle that's what and you that's, should be that yeah. was the biggest thing is that when you look at like the premium position when you look at who you have to draft in the first round it's offensive tackles the best off the best offensive tackles come in the first round yeah it's nice that you got braxton jones and stuff like that but the next level people they don't make people like that on earth they don't make the defensive ends the d tackles because right now we're seeing the defensive tackle market we can't do anything with it because they're everyone's signing those guys away. And so the top of the line people, you have to use those first round picks on D tackles, D ends and offensive tackles and quarterbacks. Like that's what all the numbers show corners are around there, but it's real, but you can see what the corners go in the open market and how easily people are trading them for like a fifth round pick, a fourth round pick. And yeah, I, I wasn't a huge fan of Rome, but it's one of those things where it's like, since everybody else really liked it, it's like, it's okay. Like, you know, I'm fine with it, but I love Jared verse and I love Byron Murphy coming out. And those were 
my two darlings coming out. So, dude, yeah, we should have had you on with us because it's a, you're like repeating everything that, <laughs> that we had said in the past. But it's like damning because like during our live show during the draft, we drafted Roman. David was like, no, <laughs> it, 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 it's yeah because it's nothing against Rome. It's everything against where you are. Like the first defensive player was taking a pick sixteen. You could have draft dropped back multiple spots and still had your pick of the litter at any defensive guy. And I said it at the time, you can't convince me that there isn't going to be one of these guys yeah. that pans out and makes a difference. And then go get yourself a, a center in round two. You, you need one with the value that that pick was garnering at the time. I would venture to say you probably could have gotten down to 13, probably got the same year second and maybe a fifth next year or something like that and with that combination of players you come out of that with caleb williams jared verse or uh like who you were saying the, the defensive tackle from texas who i also yeah, byron love. murphy uh byron murphy jr uh the third or second whichever and then jackson powers johnson gets taken 44th overall and i yeah. remember this specifically because i love jackson powers johnson and then i forget who the second favorite uh center was brad if you are a draft guy uh, zach frazier uh, yeah zach, zach frazier Steelers. is uh Steelers now, friend told me we got to steal with this kid man and he is absolutely killing it he's a borderline pro bowler on the steelers this year he's like entering that upper tier upper echelon of like centers already so you're pulling the words right out of our mouths and um just to address this comment real quick malik neighbor is going to be a beast though i agree yada um how much you want to bet he's not re-signing with the Giants and he'll be a beast on some other team in three to four years. Yeah, or like how much you want to bet that he's not going to get a Super Bowl ring. With the Giants, because he won't matter. Randy Moss does not have a Super Bowl ring, guys. Oh, Randy yeah. fucking Terrell Owens? Like, oh, New England? No, no, no. <laughs> Terrell Owens? It's, it's damning, man, no, because like those no guys, those guys dictate money, man. And when you dictate finances, you dictate how your team's supposed to function. And you know what I mean? And it's, it is a game of finances. That's why we also said like, Hey, you drafted two offensive guys, the top 10 picks. Okay. So that tells me at some point this year, you need to lean on the offense. That yeah. point should have been Arizona. In my opinion, that's where the defense started to give up more. And you should have been able to lean on your offense. And it was just an utter failure. I mean, we're, this kind of leans back into the percentage of blames. Um, Dave loves neighbors. I do love, uh, I do like, uh, I do like Malik neighbors. Um, but this is kind of the point of the team building aspect of it, right? Is okay, great. You have Roma Dunze and he's been moderately healthy on the team this year. And it's been going pretty well for him in the sense of like, yeah, he doesn't look like a total bust, but he's not producing. However, now let's say you did draft a, a center and a defensive end, and you're going into next year, and all the same things are just happening right now, but you do have a center and a nice defensive end to go into the new head coaching saga or whatever, and guess what we could do with a third or second round pick and be just as excited for this draft? Grab another wide receiver because you could have gone into this year and been pretty excited, but if you had a solid offensive line and you had a nice defensive end and that you could have gotten from this year – and you're going into this year's draft, we would have been just excited, just as excited with whoever we took in the third round as we are with Roma Dunze. And now we're going into next year hoping that you can patchwork this with two to three brand new offensive linemen who are young and hopefully can mesh and gel. I would have rather have developed that chemistry this year, even through this shit, even through the struggles. And then next year, gotten a wide receiver that you could plug in and then you could just say, hey, kid, just go catch some balls. Everything else has already been figured out for you. And, and then Brad, Dave also made the point like, right before the draft or during the draft right after i don't remember but um no it was before he said well okay if you're taking caleb williams number one that's the gamble like so so these quarterbacks get good enough to where they make receivers out of no name we kind of saw it with deandre carter a little bit like he had some chemistry with deandre carter more than yeah. he's had with tyler scott you know initially it was more than he had with roma Dunze. and it's just like okay so like Throughout the past, you have these guys that make wide receivers out of nothing. You see the Chiefs trading away Tyree Kill, right? Because Patrick Mahomes is now good enough to sit there and elevate the rest of these guys. And so, you know, the way I like came to terms with it, it's like, okay, well, I guess you're trying to give them all the weapons so there's no excuse not to succeed. Oh, yeah, but fuck the offensive line, right? Yeah, I you feel know? like. I feel like he wants Rome to actually be the number one too. Cause like, I feel with their chemistry right now, over probably either. should be right. I and think this is, this is stuff that you can watch on any one of these quarterback channels, right? Like Tim Jenkins or 
uh, uh, Dan Orlovsky or anything like that. The misuse of positions and just basic concepts of fundamentals and receivers and all that. Rome, Roma Dunze is your X receiver 10 times out of 10. And he's not currently right now. Somebody did the, the analysis. He's not even in on 12 personnel. They're putting in Keenan Allen and DJ Moore. And yeah. Keenan Allen has his deepest targets per route this year than he ever has in his entire career in his prime. So they're asking a guy who is a over the middle merchant, a slot receiving merchant, a guy who is a six, seven yards guaranteed to run 13 yards and be a jump ball receiver. When you have a guy on the fucking roster that is built to do that and you're misusing everybody, it is a fundamental high school college level of ineptitude that we're seeing right now in terms of like player usage, scheming, all that stuff. But that goes back to what we were yeah. talking about and, Tyler Scott's a smaller guy, but he's a speed guy that's supposed to be able to stretch the field. There is, de they're like schematically, there is definitely a spot where you can utilize that type of wide receiver. Yeah, it, I just like with with Scott, I don't see the the wide receiverness out of him though. Like that's that's my thing. But it's the thing, like to Dave's point, we're not using the weapons we have, right? We have all these weapons. But to that point, I remember when Keenan was signed, looking at it, his production was going downhill when he was the X receiver until he was moved, like, basically exclusively he was playing slot for the Chargers. And then, yeah, like, that's a really good, I never really thought of it that way, Dave, where it's, yeah, they're putting him outside, and it's like, why are you doing that? Like, he literally was seeming like he was cooked when he was playing outside, and it was found the life inside, but now... Yeah, why not just they're, they're throwing him on the outside and everything like that. So, yeah, and it's so frustrating. To lead back into that conversation, we were talking about this with and moving back into your point, like percentages of blame. And I know you're kind of I we were having it out a little bit yesterday where I said, you know, well, if you don't want to blame the McCaskies, which is where we're going to eventually end up with me mostly doing that. Then I said that you have to you have to significantly change your tune. I did a whole episode week two or three about are we sure Ryan Poles is good because I was a little I was sniffing this out a little bit I probably gave me a nice 45 minutes where I presented about five pages of notebook evidence where other than the Carolina trade Ryan Poles his best his best skill as a GM is not drafting it's not it's not that good his track record is not very good it's using his track up until this year especially using his draft picks to pick up players in a trade. And this year, particularly it's going really, really poorly, but he, you know, traded a fourth for Keenan Allen. I think on the surface, especially what you're seeing with what Deandre Hopkins went for in the mid season, when you go into other areas, um, I think uh, generally speaking, he does use his draft pick capital pretty well to get other players. But up until this year, it's not drafting players. It's he has hits and misses like Montez Sweat. For every Montez Sweat, there's a Chase Claypool. For every Keenan Allen, there's a Ryan Bates. That's probably the thing he's been the best at. And then in terms of fleecing the Panthers, that's what his career is going for. Right now, it's all kind of downhill and it's going worse. And so I told Polly he better start changing to Ryan Poles might suck now. Because if you can't blame them, Caskies, you need to really blame Ryan Poles, I would say. And so, uh, sorry, Brad, do you got something to comment on it? First off, I was just going to say, what's up to Philip? How's it going? <laughs> so I'm out yeah, there. you know, I waited to put that comment up. He, he uh, <laughs> text, uh, put that in there a while ago, but I was like, we're going to get there. We're, we're working our way up to the top. But yeah, I mean, that's a, it's, it's a take that a lot of people agree with for the, sure. The thing too, and what I feel like with Ryan Poles that I've consistently said is his, it's his signings of free agents that I don't agree with. Where, you know, we everybody's heard this, the low value positions, high value positions, who to sign, who not to sign. They trade away Roquan Smith. And it's like, cool, we did that. And then we got TJ Edwards, where it's like awesome. We got him for like six million a year. This is this is pro masterclass GM. This is amazing. And then all of a sudden I get the the pop-up of Bears just signed Tremaine Edmonds for $18 million a year. And I'm like, ah, oh, no, like why, why did we just do that? And then we sign. DeAndre Swift, a, a running back to a large contract when we got rid of David Montgomery. So it's 
these things where I'm like, oh, he made the right decision at the beginning, but then he does these other things where you're like, okay. And we kind of talk about like the Nate Davis, Nate Davis as a player, he's, he's been a good guard in the NFL, but if your whole thing is like the, the whole hits principle and stuff, and you didn't know that this guy doesn't practice and what happened, he got his money and he's gone. Like he's not playing for you anymore. And the, the blatant lack of looking at the center position is something that drives me bonkers because you have like, and I said this one on my show consistently, because people were like, we need offensive line. If you're someone that says that, ask yourself what position, because it's five card poker, right? If you have a bad hand, you can't just be like, man, I need more cards. It's like, no, what are you putting in? Cause you can't, you can't swap people out like you do with defensive line. So my whole piece was you have Darnell right at right tackle, right? So you have him. Then you have Tevin Jenkins, who we all agree is good. You just need to have a backup that's there because he's guaranteed going to miss like, you know, five games. And then Braxton Jones, what do you think of Braxton? Where they were hoping that he would at least turn into something. And then Nate Davis, what do you have with him? And it's up to them to identify what they're going to get out of Nate Davis. And then also the center, you didn't even add a center. You added a below average center and he's giving you below average play. So that's something to me that the set, the, the neglect for the center position, especially when you have a quarterback, a rookie quarterback, what are we seeing right now? In, in the first couple of weeks, it wasn't misses. It wasn't like them getting beat. It was them not being in the right position, not having the right pass protection, being in the right area. What fixes that? A center, a really good center, which we just neglect to get a Zach Frazier and, and fix the, a lot. The damning thing is we go back to even Lucas Patrick. We're going to get this yep. guy. Why? Because he, he's experienced with the scheme. We're going to get Shelton. To the offensive. We're going to get Shelton. Why? Because he's experienced with the scheme. This scheme is what you're investing on. <laughs> not only That's Brad, did you not to just a, fail? There were, I think, and I counted this over the summer because it pissed me off. Cause I was like, we got to get one of them. I think there were six or seven pro bowl or former pro bowl centers changing teams, kind of just doing this like center roulette. And a lot of them just swap places. And one of the ones that swapped places was Pro Bowl center Mitch Morse from the Buffalo Bills. And like you said, not only did you not get a center, you got a, a guard who played a few games at center backing up who? Pro Bowl center Mitch Morse. And then you get his backup for draft capital when you could have just signed him. It's that we say this word arrogance lately a lot. That is such an arrogant move to say, I know everyone's going out and getting these centers, but I know better. I'm going to get the backup to the guy who everyone else wants because I know he's going to be better than this guy. And then, like you said, pro scouting talent, he has arthritis. It's why he's been missing all these games. This isn't a shock to anybody. This isn't arthritis doesn't pop up overnight. Ryan Bates has been dealing with an arthritic shoulder and elbow for years and you go out and you spend draft capital on that guy because your ego probably did that because you tried to get him the year before you couldn't get him so now you're gonna absolutely put the nail in that coffin like i like centers that play center you know like that's uh call me crazy but it's like uh you know that's that's my number one criteria lucas patrick played majority at guard and we're like this is our center even though he was a backup but he was thrusted in because the Packers line was always banged up. So to, it's that to one of the best Hall of Fame quarterbacks. Like, yeah, going to make your job a lot easier because he gets Aaron the ball. Out. Yeah. Aaron Rodgers exactly. back there. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so we've, like I said, I mentioned chess and checkers and that comes from a quote that Yurko said on ESPN 1000. And he said, listen, as a lineman, when we get into a game, we start with checkers. If I could just physically manhandle you, we don't get to the whole hand fighting martial arts bullshit. I'm just going to grab you and throw you and then go sack your quarterback. And you're totally seeing it with Colin Shelton. He's undersized. He gets tossed around. It's great, but you know the scheme, right? It, We're going to outsmart you. And with the defensive line picks too, I've actually not been big fans of it because, you know, going back to the stats and everything, when you see physical athletes that have 
lack of production, like a Dominique Robinson, Javon actually follows into that, and Zach Pickens, typically they do not pan out. What Javon is doing is an outlier thing, being yes. really good, and he deserves all the credit in the world for how he's transformed his body, how much effort he's putting in. Because actually, I think Yurko and like others have talked about this, where it's that whole Mike Tyson thing. Everybody has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. And the reason why those really good athletes at D-line don't pan out is because as soon as they get hit, they're going to try and throw you, which at that case, typically if you're not that great and you weren't able to really do that and have success at the NCAA level, you're not going to have that same success in the NFL level. And that's why you see them kind of really start to struggle at that NFL level. So Jervon, to me, kudos to him but typically you see them looking more like what zach pickens is right now where pickens just looks lost because he's like i can't beat you with my athleticism i didn't do that in college but and it still doesn't work here that third round pick should have been an offensive lineman instead of zach pickens and and so like like you were saying about just um pure analytics okay i think the only guy i could really think of right now is like max crosby who's a fourth round pick Mm -hmm. There's very yeah. few guys that like, well, who Jared Allen might have been undrafted. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah. you really have to like go search and do your homework to find guys that have gone in late rounds and panned out. And um, most of the at, time at they're position. they're hustle guys. They're high energy yep. guys. John Randall, Hall of Famer from the Vikings, undersized defensive tackles because he just never quit. He never got tired. Max Crosby never quits. He never gets tired. John, uh, like you said, uh, 69, who was uh, Jared Allen? Jared Allen. Jared yeah. Allen was a hustle and motor guy. It wasn't that they were like these physical freaks that kind of came out and just dominated everybody. It was because you had the same thing about him as the same thing that you say about a wide receiver who's drafted late. Well, Wes Welker is shifty and Julian Edelman is shifty and quick and Puka Nakua, he just kind of finds those zones and right. Like it's the same phrases, but that's why to your point, Paulie, it's just, it's a waste of time when you do this shit with, with third round defensive tackles when you could go out and get a free eight. you just got chris williams from the browns for a seventh round pick just do that in the future save those third round picks for offensive linemen yeah and so then just moving up the ladder one step and okay so ryan poles deserves some criticism as well here right but the obvious thing that should have been done here today was to move on from the staff at minimum scapegoat the offensive coordinator but really you should have moved on from the staff in the last offseason now it's obvious that you should do it and to just sit there and waste more time till the end of the season is a waste but part of me questions whether they'll even do it in the offseason moving forward and so now you get into a conversation about ownership and why well we might be too cheap to keep a guy on the books while we hire another guy. And that that is ownership interference that we're dealing with. And even though and, and David, I don't I, I know you're gonna make a lot of points here probably. So I don't want to like kill it right as you get started. But Ooh, for I just hate this conversation because to me it always feels like that cheap, cheap way out. Like when we said, hey, this is the best team a number one overall pick has ever stepped into, and we were all high on it during the offseason, we weren't crediting McCaskies. We weren't that that conversation doesn't exist until everything bombs and fails. And so we've gone like I love the question, like you said, and I haven't really answered it, but the percentage of blame fr from bottom to top. And so, of course, things on the field could always be better. The coordinator's not doing him any justice. The head coach is responsible for enabling all this. The GM is responsible for putting all this supposed talent on there that isn't gelling isn't is built outside in and it's just unorthodox but now you know at the end of the day there is ultimately people up top that have to pay the price and like i said i i mean they don't have to pay the price they won't they're not going to sell the team it's not going to change which is why i find it to be a nuisance conversation and i'm not going to have much more input on it than that but dave I, we go back and forth on this all the time i know you're pretty damn yeah. passionate about it starts at the top and it doesn't start at the bottom. Like I think it starts at the bottom. Uh, I'll present to Brad kind of like what we've discussed in many, many episodes and all this stuff over time. But 
it's it's one of those uh, chicken or the egg kind of problems, right? Where even yesterday we were arguing about this yesterday. Well, you, you can't you can't blame the G, the GM for not making moves if the his bosses are strongly suggesting wink wink that we don't want to pay another coach or that they're strongly suggesting that this is for the integrity of the Chicago Bears before you make any moves Ryan always think is this good for the Bears because once you guess what we're a history when you're gone they'll still be here Ryan so remember that before you make moves because you can't convince me otherwise that George doesn't have some sort of influence over Ryan Poles long term but the other part of it is what we've talked about is uh, you know, you, you like other sports, Brad, you know, the Cubs, once they sold from the Wrigley family to the Ricketts, you know, you saw this massive overhaul. We used the Washington Commanders yesterday as an example. This is a team that is on the exact same timeline as the Bears were. And guess what happened? Bam, like instant success with a new ownership group that approaches things with modern ideas and modern philosophies. However, on the other hand, you have examples like the Texans where they just kind of hand the reins off to new GMs. They're kind of consistently successful. The TJ Watt or the JJ Watt years, the now the Deshaun Watson years, whatever that was worth to you, you know, they were really successful at the time. Now they're back on a thing of success, right? So there are times Jim Ursay, absolutely crazy coked out, you know, NFL owner. You got success there. You have a Super Bowl there. Why? In my I'm mind, it's because Bill he – and- Because he hires Bill Polian and he fucks off and does coke out of strippers' buttholes. Like, that's literally what he got arrested for. This guy is insane. But he leaves his team alone and then he just rides the success. And then you have your Jerry Joneses of the world, which is, to me, just the NFC's Jim Irsay, who loves to have his finger on the pulse of that team. So in these kinds of cases, to me, nothing will ever change until ownership changes. The Chicago Bulls and the White Sox will never be relevant as long as a Reinsdorf is at the top, we just have accepted that. And I think to me, Paulie has almost talked me out of it because we have seen some moderate success growing with the Chicago bears and the McCaskies were there. So to his point, it's kind of one of those things where it's chicken or the egg. I have to agree with Paul because the evidence in his point is there, but now when it does revert now, it's kind of like, well, my point is coming back. The ownership is still kind of a problem. I don't know where you stand on that. And just real quick, like, wasn't Ryan Storff there while the Bulls did win six championships? Same thing. He fucked okay. off. He got lucky with right. one guy. Okay, and he still was there when the White Sox won in 2005, right? And so, sure. so like you, like you said, Jim Mercer was there when Bill Pulley and Peyton Manning were there. And, and so I get it. There's examples of being overcoming. Yeah. I mean, and that's why I said, like, we're going to really need Caleb to be a superstar. Yeah. <laughs> and, but and that's where right. I look at, like, Kevin Warren. Because to me, hey – if I was a McCaskey right now, I wouldn't sell. You know, I, I'd be like, hey, this is my team. My my grandfather, great-grandfather, whatever, like, built this team and everything like that. I'm looking at Kevin Warren going, "Isn't wasn't your job to do that whole Arlington Heights thing? And it's still not there yet. But also, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> like, what else is he also supposed to be doing? Because if Kevin Warren got me hope because... I don't think you're really going to get rid of the McCaskies unless I've heard some other things just because of like taxes when it, when, because we all die when Virginia eventually kicks the bucket. I've heard that there's some weird tax things with that, but I still don't think that they're ever going to be selling ultimately and moving on from it. And, but this is where it's like Kevin Warren, Kevin Warren wants to do things different. And Kevin Warren seems like a no nonsense guy to me. I want to see him kind of go out there and, lay the hammer down and be like, listen, this is not how we build winners and then do that. And then they're like, Hey, I'm sorry for that. We're going to be resuming this. And so to me, like with that whole percentages, I actually put ownership at like the smallest. And then I actually put coaches and players equally because DJ Moore, I see him just dogging it out there and like has the, you know, he has the attitude of a five-year-old child um after he's not getting the ball after he just signed this gigantic deal he's not helping things and they're not executing and so to me it's players and coaches and then it's like then it's the gm and then it's like small ownership just because they're simply not executing that's my take on it also j2k what's good i saw you out there too (laughs) yeah shout out to j2k man he's he's the best 
uh, did our whole branding for our channel, our logo, and everything like that. Oh, so we, cool. We have absolutely love J2K. Yeah. Um, I'm, I was cautiously excited as well, Brad, about Kevin Warren and the process of what he was going to, the prospects of what he was going to do with this team. I think within like six to 10 months, I realized quickly that guy is here for one reason, one reason only to head the development of a new stadium. And I think he has next to no input on football decisions. Um, I That's purely speculative. But when you just see, you know, Ryan doing all the, uh, the approach to re-signing DJ Moore putting his cap guy in the room and then giving it the presentation packet to Kevin Warren. And he flips through it quickly and goes like, looks good to me. He's a good player. He should stay here for a while. Like that's yeah. not a, that's not a team president that's going like, so, Hey, let's have like a full on thing. And this kind of goes back to what we started this with. What the fuck are you having one and a half hour meetings for before your press conference? What are you garnering? Yeah. Who's in that room? If Kevin Warren's in that room and George is in that room and all the coaches are in that room and Ryan pulls at the head of that table, who is saying anything of substance in this room that has any gravitas? Because there are too many goddamn cooks in this kitchen, first of all, right? When you have McCaskey interference, when you have uh, uh, Kevin Warren being this team president for what? I don't know. What is his exact title? Um, what is going on here exactly? I have a, a great quote for you guys. I saw this come across today. If I can and just real quick, this David, down. just like meanwhile, John Gruden's getting up at four in the four a.m. to like watch tape, right? That's yeah. what we're talking about here. You're taking an hour yeah. and a half to figure out your press conference. So, uh, sorry, go ahead with yeah. the quote. All right, we understand your frustration. We're frustrated too. It would be a natural reaction to just say, "Back up the truck and let's start a major overhaul." After a particularly disparaging loss. A season ticket holder told me, fire somebody. We deserve better than this. I get it. You deserve it. And your Bears deserve it to be winners. The decisions we announced today may not be the easiest or most popular, but we believe that they are the best decisions for the Chicago Bears. You guys want to take a guess who said that, when, why, what? George McCaskey in what, year one of Flus? George McCaskey said that, when they retained Ryan uh, Ryan Pace and Matt Nagy for the lame duck year over the summer, That's it, it sounds great job, eerily David. similar, right? It sounds eerily similar, and this is why you want to like, Polly. I'm never going to try to convince you because part of our fun thing is that we just bust each other's balls and yell at each other sometimes. Always try and convince me. I'm open to change. Yeah, but what the? F it is when you talk about. That isn't that isn't a Kevin Warren quote. That isn't a Ryan Poles quote. That isn't a Matt Eberflus quote. That is a George McCaskey in regards to why they kept Ryan Pace and Ryan and Matt Nagy it going into the season where they drafted Justin Fields. Everybody knew back then the writing was on the wall. It is completely pointless. It is a complete waste of time. You should rebuild and restructure and do all these things. And you let Bruce Arians walk out the fucking door. And you let Chris Ballard tell you to go fuck yourself because he wanted to trade Jay Cutler. And you you said, not on my watch. So when you say, yeah, you can't blame ownership. These are We're talking about fundamental direction changing decisions of a franchise that are stopped by one man and one man only or whoever that one man and his underlings are. They're complete yes men, and they have zero, zero concept of not repeating your mistakes. They keep doing the same thing and expecting a different result. I never really liked that definition of insanity. I think it's like a good cliche, but it's not necessarily. This is fucking stupid. This isn't crazy. You're just stupid. You just so, don't get it. You're doing the same thing over and over, and it applies four years later and you can see it, you don't need to observe a team from far away. It happened in your own fucking building, and you're doing it again. So I know we've gone a little bit over our time limit, and you know I know Brad's got to go. By the way, everybody in chat, Brad's got his A22 film breakdown that he's going to be doing after this show, so make sure you go check out Unbearable Sports and make sure you go and check out his content. And, you know, I'll just say it again. Like like I said, when we were saying this is the best team and number one overall pick has come into, we weren't crediting him. But I love what Brad said. I still put blame on the ownership. The percentage of it may not be as high as you do, David. I'm not saying they're not to blame. 
they are. It's just ultimately, I think there are other things that could be fixed a lot easier than McCaskey selling the team. Brad, I don't know. Any closing thoughts? Yeah, I guess closing thoughts. It's, uh, you know, like I've said, like what I started the show with, I am not a big fire the coach, fire the coach type of guy. But right now, I am because I think that that is the best thing because when your team is giving up and you've already had two players only meetings as well, or like player meetings to come to uh, the coaches and talk to them, that's where they're, they've tried everything. And if, if they've tried everything, sometimes like there's an old uh, person I used to work with that said, if someone disagrees with you, did you try convincing them once? Didn't work. Did you try it again? All right. Well, some people don't want to don't want to change. And sometimes, you, you know, with that, you just kind of have to move on. And to me, it's it's one of those. You just have to move on. You just have to go through it because when they're in those rooms, they're not going to want to take to coaching until they know that things are moving forward because they know they everyone sees the writing on the walls. They know they're not going to be there. Yeah. So. You know, I had a I had a great teacher once go to the chalkboard and he drew a uh, six sideways. And he asked, is this a six or is this a nine? He's like, depends which way you want to turn it. Yeah. He's like, but understand, if I'm passionately arguing with you that it's a nine and you're passionately arguing with me that it's a six, I truly believe what I'm saying and you truly believe what you're saying. And you ultimately have to re have respect for that. Dave, any closing thoughts? George McCaskey's a fucking bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us in chat. That's the best closing. <laughs> closing <laughs> you can't right top there. that. <laughs> Fucking A, dude. Guys, thank you so much. Once again, Unbearable Sports. Let's go check out his A22 film breakdown. And thank you so much for joining us tonight, especially in this unbearable week of Bears football. So thanks, guys. See you, boys.